everyone, and welcome to the 191st episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. Most of you know me as JAG. I am the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit organization introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways, graphic novels, music, uh, animated videos. Today, we are joined by Jens Heike. Uh, before I even begin to introduce our guest, I want to remind all of you who are watching us on Zoom, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, go ahead, type your questions into the comment sections of your platform, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Though fair warning, I, I found this book very fascinating, so I have a lot of questions of my own. Uh, Jens Heike is a researcher, writer, and competitive cyclist with degrees from the University of Chicago, the London School of Economics, and Princeton. Jens worked uh, as an early employee and executive in several successful tech uh, and uh, companies, startups, including one that pioneered the mobile internet. Um, he has uh, worked uh, since he retired from tech as a writer and a researcher conducting field research around the world from Bosnia to Botswana. Uh, his book, Out of the Melting Pot into the Fire Multiculturalism in the World's past and America's future uh, discusses the origin of the term um, melting pot and multiculturalism and surveys uh, multi-ethnic polities throughout history with starkly different outcomes depending on whether they pursued uh, a more unified or group identity model um, and explores the implications for the United States, especially given our current uh, obsession with DEI and identity politics. So Jens, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on today. So um, our audience always likes to learn a little bit about our guests' origin stories. I'm curious if looking back, there were any early childhood experiences or mentors that may have put you on the path to exploring uh, how different approaches to ethnic diversity um, can yield dramatically different results. Yeah, so uh, uh, my origin story is really an immigrant uh, origin story, and, and that's where I got a lot of the thinking for this book. Uh, my father was um, an immigrant. He came over on a boat right after, uh, well, uh, eight years after World War II. He had just turned 18. So a teenager with one suitcase all by himself. He uh, sailed into New York Harbor and, and became an American. And you know the most incredible thing about his story is that he came from Germany. Yet he was he was actually sponsored uh, by a Jewish American family. A Jewish American family had lost uh, people, uh, family members in the Holocaust. And you know what an amazing thing that this German kid gets basically adopted by a, a Jewish family here in the U.S. And you know how does that happen? Well, I it goes down to this very American notion that people should be treated as, as individuals and not as members of groups. Uh, you know, there's no uh, group guilt or inherited guilt uh, that everybody can come to this country and, and be seen and valued as an ind individual. And that went on uh, when he joined the military, he joined the military within a year of arriving here. And he had officers who were, had fought against Germans, and they also accepted him. And, and once again, they treated him as an individual. And I think people who've lived their whole lives in America don't realize what an amazing thing that is, that this notion of, of, of valuing people's individuals and, and not seeing them as, as members of, of distinct groups. Uh, so that, that was kind of the start. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, um, interesting, you know, that your your dad, uh, as, as an immigrant out, he could have named you Jim or John or Joe, uh, and perhaps growing up, maybe you had wished at, at times that he had. So I'm wondering if uh, just as a little boy uh, growing up with uh, a name that isn't like obviously um, clear in terms of how to pronounce it, did you feel a separateness or did you feel that 
the schools that you went to, you too were pretty much accepted for who you are. I, I did. And, and I was, and that's, you know, that's what's so cool is, is that, that, you know, somebody can have a name like mine or they can be called Vivek Ramaswamy. Right. And, <laughs> and I, you know, or, and, you know, the two of us don't look anything alike. Our, our origins are completely different yet. Nobody would ever question that we're both as American as apple pie. And, you know, you go to other parts of the world and you quickly realize things don't work that way. You know, there, there, there are people Turkish descent who have lived in Germany for three generations and they're still called Turks. Um, people, ethnic Chinese in Malaysia who are still called Chinese after 500 years of living there. So, so this is a really special thing about America that, that I came to, to value highly. And, you know, I think all Americans should, that, that anybody can become part of this American team. So um, if I understand this book, the research for this book began many, many years ago. Uh, what was the inspiration for it? Obviously, maybe a bit from uh, the kind of assimilationist America that you remember growing up in to the, this current, um, again, preoccupation with uh, separate identities and segregation. Mm -hmm. Um, tell us a little bit about your process. Yeah, so so it really, most of it went back to a single seminal moment when I was a PhD student at, at, at Princeton. And I was I was selected for this uh, group of PhD students to, to recommend new faculty members. And there's like four or five of us. And the first thing anybody in that committee said was what the skin color and gender of that recommendation needed to be. It needed to be a woman of color. And this is, mind you, this is back in 1989, right? So this has gone yes. on a long time. And it, it was kind of at that point that, you know, I started thinking, what are what are the long-term implications of, of distinguishing people uh, by group like this? Going, you know, against that experience that my father had, that suddenly you're no longer an American. You're this group or you're that group. I, how does that play out? How, did, how has it played out in history? Uh, and that's yes. that's when I started to really think about it. And I, one of the other things that happened with that episode is it actually led me to leave the university because I, I figured, you know, that sort of conversation was happening in faculty lounges around the country and that the future in academia for me might not be so good given that. Mm -hmm. So so that's when right. I, I drove out to Silicon Valley and taught myself how to program and and ended up writing you code. learned to, you learned to code in in the comic <laughs> parlance and and struck out for places where uh, I guess you felt that your contributions would be evaluated on an individual basis and and not based on on your group identity uh so let's start with an understanding of of the term and, and the title you know out, out of the melting pot uh let's the history of that concept here in America um was it explicitly considered an ideal model? If so, when did we begin to turn against that um, to the point where even the mention of the term melting pot is apparently considered a microaggression um, on some campuses? Yeah, so, so the melting pot model occurred in the United States organically, almost from the get-go. Uh, you know, you can go all the, all the way back to... Uh, 1600s, uh, New York, Amst uh, was called New Amsterdam at the time. There's less than a thousand people there. 18 different languages were spoken. Uh, and over time, those people melded together. But it was really in the early 1900s, 1908 specifically, that uh, Israel Zangwill, who's a Russian uh, Jewish immigrant, wrote a play called The Melting Pot. And, and that really put the term in the popular lexicon and uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a huge fan of it. And it was at that point that the government actually started talking about it in literature. So by the time you get to uh, World War II, the U.S. was issuing a guide for new immigrants that specifically said, our country is a melting pot. We we expect you to come here and share your culture and uh, with all of us and, and together we'll form, you know, sort of a unifying American identity. So that was, you know, roughly 1940s. Um, if, you know, people who are boomers like me will remember um, uh, what was that show called? Uh, 
uh, Amer American Schoolhouse, you know, the one that had mm -hmm. the songs, I'm Just a Bill on Capitol Hill, all that stuff. They had a melting pot song too, right? Um, in 1970s, 1980s. Um, so, Interesting. and it was all over in textbooks. When I grew up, it was in, it was in most of the uh, social sciences textbook and it was lauded as this great thing. Um, so when so did that start to change? And uh so, so like a lot of the the, the nasty trends, um, it it started with elite academics, um, specifically with with elite uh, academic anthropologists, uh, Franz Boas, notably other people, Ruth Benedict, Mar Margaret Mead, in in the nineteen fifties, they started this notion of cultural relativism, uh, the idea that you can't judge cultures, you can't say one is better than another. And, and that undermines the whole melting pot ideal because that ideal is based on taking this and that from different cultures, you know, whatever you deem best for your circumstances. And when you have cultural relativism, uh, that no longer makes sense because, you, you know, you can't evaluate cultures against each other. Um, it took decades for that thinking to kind of seep into the broader society. But by the time you get to the, you know, 1980, Jim, Jimmy Carter gave a speech where he said, I don't see this country as a melting pot. I see it as a mosaic, different, different values, different, uh, different, different morals, uh, different cultures. Um, Interesting. And so um, you observed that uh, the, the political elites tend to be the most prominent proponents of um a prominent opponents of melting pot integration and the biggest supporters of policies that distinguish and divide people by ethnicity and race. What are some examples of that? For example, uh, with regards to political initiatives, maybe that one, but then you saw, see uh, support for them among more elite uh, populations. Um, and any thoughts on what is motivating that divide is it again kind of elite education yeah so so that you know this is this is a thing that goes all the way back in history it can go back to the ottoman empire and and the way a, a lot of people don't know this but but the the muslim ottomans who ran that empire were a tiny minority for hundreds of years uh, they ruled over Christian Jews, uh, you know, all kinds of different groups. And the way they did that is, is by dividing, they took a divide and conquer approach. They, they kept those groups separate and, and, and kind of made themselves the, the distributor of goodies. Um, so all those different groups had to appeal to the Ottoman uh, central command to, you know, to get their goodies. And they contended against each other um, to do that. So it, it was a divide and conquer approach. Uh, same thing happened during the colonial era. Uh, the, you know, British and Belgian colonialists in particular uh, took that approach, divide and conquer. If we keep groups separate and kind of, you know, do favors for this group or that group, uh, we can pit those groups against each other and and maintain our own position and our own control because they're focused on competing with each other instead of challenging us. Um, so that goes all the way up into the modern era. You know, when you think of uh, modern elite politicians, uh, one of the ways they they gain a loyal constituency is is by appealing to specific ethnic groups or saying, you know, I'm going to do this for 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 you, group A or group B. Um, and and that way, by by kind of dividing people up like that, they, they establish a loyal constituency. Um, Interesting. Um so what are some of the examples like let's say propositions to to end uh, affirmative uh, action how 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 does this actually show up in terms of oh, yeah so so uh, this is kind of an interesting thing that i you know i, I don't think many people know but I, starting in the 90s there have been a number of state propositions uh to to basically outlaw affirmative action um prop 209 i believe it was in california was was the first one ward Connerly uh, sponsored that and that passed overwhelmingly people said we don't want affirmative action well guess what it it failed among the wealthiest most educated people in the state so so it failed miserably in marin county which at the time was the richest county in in the country 
Um, and the same thing, there was a similar initiative in Washington state. Uh, it passed overwhelmingly uh, statewide, but then when you took you know, the contingent of people making over 100,000, they all voted against it. So, so curiously, the, the wealthiest, most elite, most educated people were the ones most opposed to get rid of, getting rid of affirmative action. Um, Fascinating. And I think that this is continuing to, to show up with, uh, with recent polling that we've seen on, on the um, Supreme Court decision to, to ban uh, racial preferences in um, university admissions. Um, actually, you think that uh, it would be universally opposed by groups that might benefit from them. But I, I think that, you know, it's almost as if you're seeing a, a little green shoots of melting pot coming back with people uh, across different so-called identities actually um, saying, no, you know, I think people should be treated based on merit and, and uh, individualism. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, if I could add something, you know, one of the, one of the reasons that position is palatable for, for rich elites and it's the, it's the dirty little secret of, of legacy admissions, right? This, this came out in the Harvard case that, that, you know, nearly half, something like 43% of the white kids at, at Harvard are admitted for legacy or dean's list type reasons. They didn't get there by merit. So, so if you're a wealthy elite, affirmative action is no skin off your nose because your kid's already getting in under the legacy preferences. Um, so, you know, my take is if you want to get rid of affirmative action, get rid of the legacy preferences and, and then all those elites will come around and pretty soon they'll be against a free of action too. And yes, also get rid of preferences for uh, the children of school administrators and professors and make it exactly. uh, a purely, purely merit-based uh, affair. So uh, one of my greatest delights in reading uh, out of the melting pot into the fire is, is the history that I learned as you survey uh, various ancient civilizations and experiments with either the melting pot or multicultural approach. We can't get to all of those examples in one hour, uh, but perhaps you could contrast a couple of the earliest and most striking instances uh, of the divergent approaches to um, diversity and their consequences. Yeah, I um, really have to start with Rome because that's the that's the most profound example. And you know, interestingly, and I I cite them in in my book. Uh, early Roman figures, people like the Emperor Claudius and Cicero. Uh, specifically acknowledged that Rome's success was due to it following a melting pot approach. Uh, they didn't specifically use that term, but but they actually described the process. They said, you know, anybody can become a Roman and join the Roman team. And that's what makes us so resilient and so, so strong. And uh, Cicero and Claudius are just two people that said that. There are many other historians along the way that said, you know, this is why Rome works. And it goes back to the very beginning of, of the Roman Republic that, um, you know, we tend to think of, of Rome as being kind of this homogeneous entity. It wasn't from the get-go. It was actually a fusion of Volscian and Sabine, Sabines and Etruscans and all these different groups. And as it got into the imperial era, that, that model continued and they continued to bring in people from all different races and ethnicities and Romanize, make them Roman in this Roman melting pot. So I give one example, a Lucius Quietus, he's a black African guy who joined the Roman legions and he was really talented and he rose up the ranks, became a general, uh, eventually became a, a, a consul, which is, you know, it's like being prime minister or president. So, you know, 2000 years before Barack Obama was elected, the, the Romans have a consul who, who's a black African. Uh, so, so your race and your ethnicity were no bar to becoming Roman and to rising up the Roman ranks. And what that did is it gave people from all over the Mediterranean, regardless of their origins, this sense that they could be Roman and that they had a stake in Roman success. And a lot of these people had never even been to Rome, yet they considered themselves Roman. 
so you get to like the first or second second century uh, AD and Roman legions, they're, they're not a bunch of Italian guys. Uh, they're they're Pannonians, they're they're Spaniards, they're they're Britons, people from all over the place, and every single one of those people considered themselves to be Roman, even though you know they came from somewhere else. Um, and what that meant is, when, whenever the Roman Empire faced external challenges, there were a lot of people willing to you know to lay down their lives in its defense, and, and so you you didn't have one you know, 1 million people who lived in Rome who were Roman, you had 50 million people all over the ecumen that, that, who thought they were Roman. Uh, and it just gave that Rome this amazing resilience that allowed it to last, you know, a thousand years or 2000 years, if you include Byzantium. So why did the Roman Empire fall? I'm <laughs> just kidding. Obviously, it's beyond the scope of your book and uh, certainly this this interview. Um, but you do venture uh, some explanations of how the shift from the melting pot model uh, to more of a multicultural one helped maybe hasten the decline. So can you explain? Yeah. So I, again, I, I would not cite this as, as the only reason, but a significant reason was that, that beginning in the fourth century, um, the Huns started to push um, people, you know, the, uh, uh, across the Eurasian steppe onto Roman territory, especially Goths. And, and this wonderful assimilation, Romanization model that Rome was using up until then started to break down because they had, you know, it's kind of like our southern border today. They had these massive incursions of of Goths who were basically fleeing the Huns, uh, settling on Roman territory. And, you know, in one instance, uh, 200,000 Theravingi crossed the Danube and then Emperor Valens settled them, you know, on the Roman side. Uh, so you, you started to have all these segregated ethnic enclaves of people who were no longer being assimilated. They were just settling in their 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 own little you know areas, and they provided fighting men. But those men didn't integrate um, with the Roman troops as they had for all the previous generations. Instead, they were sort of segregated out, spoke their own languages, they had their own leaders. And eventually they became a kind of a dangerous third column in uh, within Rome. And there was a, a I wouldn't say a right wing backlash. Uh, that's sort of what we have today. Uh, but there was a backlash and it, it really tore the Roman Empire apart. And it was eventually those those um, goth immigrants who, who, you know, dismembered the Roman Empire. Uh, so in terms of relatively uh, recent history, obviously the example of Rwanda jumps out, not just because of the scale of the genocide committed there, um, but how policies implemented by Belgian colonialists helped to set the stage for the eventual violence. Could you talk a bit about that experience and also how Rwandans themselves uh, reacted to it by essentially abolishing ethnic identity with regards to policy. Yeah, it's it's a it's a fascinating story and I know you know there's a tendency of people to think of countries like Rwanda uh, as places that have these an ancient uh tribal rivalries yeah. that go back hundreds of years and and the reality is quite different uh you know before the belgian colonialists arrive in, in the early 1900s there there were these two groups the hutus and tutsis uh but there really wasn't any uh regular violence between the two they have they have exactly the same language culture everything's identical and there's a lot of intermarriage between them and hutus could become tutsis and tutsis could become hutus and when other Outsiders invaded, the, the two of them banded together to fight them. So they actually got along pretty well. And the Belgians, uh, when they came in, they decided, kind of like the Ottomans, that the, the the best way to manage this vast territory with just a handful of Belgians is, is to take a divide and conquer approach. Uh, so, so based on some kind of weird racial theories, they um, they separated the two out They and issued mandatory identity cards that said, you know, whether each person was a Hutu or a Tutsi. 
And then they implemented a system of affirmative action that favored the Tutsis for um, they had that for roughly 30, 40 years. So if you wanted a government job or education, uh, it was really easy as a Tutsi. Uh, it was almost impossible as a Hutu. And then bizarrely, just before Rwanda got independence, they, they flipped that system on the head on its head and favored the Hutus instead of the Tutsis. Now, you know, if, if you were to develop an exercise in how you could pit two groups against each other in, you know, homicidal furor, uh, this, this would be how to do it. I mean, uh, you know, you couldn't dream of a better way to do it. Uh, so after, after uh, Rwanda got independence, the Hutus maintained that system of preferences where they got favored for uh, employment, for education, for everything. And that went on for another 30 plus years. Uh, and all along, the, the tension between those two groups is just simmering and getting worse and worse. Um, because, you know, we know from sociological experiments that just the mere, uh, mere act of separating people and saying you're group A and group B, you're group B, that that has a really terrible and invidious effect. Um, and it did here. And, you know, the preferences made it worse. So you get to 1994 and... Um, uh, the Hutu pre uh, president's plane was shot down, and then it just exploded. Um, there was a the Hutus went on a rampage and killed uh, roughly a million Tutsis and moderate Hutus in, in just a hundred days. Uh, most of that with machetes. Um, and you know the amazing thing about this is it wouldn't have happened. If somebody, if the Belgians hadn't come in there and distinguished between the two groups, it never would have happened. Uh, it was issuing those identity cards and having, you know, 40, 50 plus years of affirmative action that pitted those groups against each other in a death struggle. Um, and then so, so what was the reaction after after the blood? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so after all that happened, the the, the um a Tutsi militia came in, the RPF, and managed to stop it. And, and at that point, they said, this division between our two groups has, you know, has caused these unimaginable horrors. We have to end it now. And we're not even going to, there's not going to be any payback. Uh, what we're going to do is from this day forward, declare that we're all Rwandans. There are no more groups. We are all Rwandans. And that's kind of a national motto there. Um, and their constitution forbids political parties or any other organizations that are based on group identity. And uh, I should add the other thing they did, they switched from what was more or less a socialist economy to market capitalism. And, you know, what happened after that, their, their economy soared. They went from being dead last in the world to, uh, you know, having the highest economic growth for, for many, many years in, in, in the entire world. Um, Wow. Uh, well, that kind of feeds into a question that just came up um, on uh, Facebook. Uh, Jacob Sawicki asks, uh, you mentioned the Ottomans and the divide and conquer approach. Uh, he once heard the Soviets did the same thing in moving people around the USSR. Do you know if that's true? Yeah. So, so um the Soviet Union is really um, an, an interesting uh, scenario that that really uh, hasn't gotten the coverage it deserved. It was actually the first uh, modern uh, nation to institute affirmative action. Uh, and uh, Terry Martin wrote a wonderful book about it uh, called The Affirmative Action Empire uh, and talked about how that evolved. And basically what it came out of is that Marx didn't have a good he didn't have any theories for how to deal with ethnicity. He thought ethnicity was irrelevant. Um, yet Lenin and Stalin were confronted with, with this former empire that had literally dozens of different ethnicities. And it's like, okay, what do we do? Well, they came up with a theory that, that said that ethnicity and nationalism are forces that need to exhaust themselves. It's like one of these Marxian stages that we have to go through to achieve socialist utopia. Uh, so they actually encouraged 
having distinct ethnic identities, has perfect multiculturalism. And in fact, they stamp these identities in people's passports. You know, so it said if you were a Kazakh or or you know whatever in in, in your passport. And they instituted a system of quotas and affirmative action. And how did that end? Well, it turned out that these these distinct identities that they in, encourage started to go at each other. And there, I, there was lots of ethnic antagonism. And I'm, I'm forgetting the exact number, but ultimately it ended in either nine or 10 different um, episodes of ethnic cleansing. It was an absolute disaster. Um, and it's it's an episode that, that I think has largely been forgotten, but uh, that book by Ter Terry Martin covers it very nicely. Mm -hmm. Um, when you say kind of, uh, or Terry Martin had uh, the title Affirmative Action um, Empire, other than stamping the ethnic identities on people's identification papers, I mean, were there uh, quotas or sort of, uh, you know, we're going to accept this many students of, of that particular ethnicity or for jobs? How did how did that kind of work? Absolutely. There. Yeah, there there were indeed quotas for for various groups, um, you know, over I, I don't remember the exact period of time. I think it was it was maybe a little less than a decade and it ended and ended very, <laughs> very badly. Um, ended ended it, in it, tears. Uh, all right, uh, my modern galt on Instagram, always the first to the races with the question, uh, says it used to be said that Im immigrants coming to America would integrate pretty quickly, but that does not seem to be the case anymore. Is this due to the rate of immigration or the rise of identity politics? So I guess we'll just start with the premise. Do you think that it is true that there is uh, less assimilation or is that is that something which can be quantified? Yeah, I, 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 that's an excellent question. And, and uh, you know, I, I wish I had it right at my fingertips because I don't remember the exact numbers, but, but there was a, I think it was a Pew survey back in the early 2000s of, of Hispanic immigrants and, and 90 plus percent of them thought it was very important for their kids to to uh, learn English. And, and I, I believe a large majority of them were even opposed to bilingualism. They said, I just want my kid to learn English. And one of the things this poll showed is, is that the longer immigrants had been in the United States, the less they felt like that. So why would that be? Well, you know, you think about it because they are being told, no, you don't need to learn English. That's an imposition on you for you to have to, you know, to 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 share our language, to learn, you know, learn the American language. Uh, because most of these immigrants come in, they want to assimilate. Uh, they know that that's the path to success. It's it's these elites that are telling them that that they, you know, that somehow that's bad for them to do. Um, and again, to me, it's, you know, it goes back to the question we were talking about earlier, how elites seem to be the ones that are most opposed to 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 having everybody be one united country and being together. Um, All right. Well, uh, I had a question about immigration, given that this is an election year and uh, the border is an issue on everybody's mind. Uh, so we have a question along those lines from Alexander uh, Sabinatov on X, and he asks, is there data that shows a host nation's response to open or more, uh, you know, porous borders versus something more regulated like the Ellis Island model. How does that uh, play into the phenomena that, that you research and discuss in the book? I, I'm sorry, I, 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 could you give me that question one more time? I didn't understand the first part. He, he was talking sure. specifically about the United uh, States. Yes, yeah, so this is Alexander Sabinatov on X, and he asks, is there data that shows um, a host nation's response to open or loose borders versus something more regulated like the Ellis Island model. Okay. Yeah, it was the host nation part that that threw me because I wasn't sure if he was talking more generically or just, just about the United States. Uh, 
you know, the the United States itself has had has had both approaches. You know, up until the the uh, between the nineteen uh, 19- 20s immigration laws, which set a, a, a quota system up until the 1965 Immigration Act, we had actually fairly limited immigration in this country. And in 65, it opened up. And, you know, we can we can see how it, it, it's worked. It's there. There has been less less integration in countries that that have had. There haven't been very many, frankly, that have allowed completely open immigration, I, I think have, have, have had problems with it. Um, and, you know, I'd specifically look at, at um, some other countries in the Anglosphere, uh, Canada and Australia in particular, um, people think they have open immigration. They actually don't. They both have point systems that are very restrictive in terms of who they allow in. Um, you know, they have to, most of, the, most of them have to be qualified professionals. They, they don't just let anybody in. Um, you know, the record around the world, uh, frankly, isn't that great because most countries have not had open immigration. There are very few that, that have done that over the years. All right. I'm going to take just a couple more then. As I said, I have been fascinated by this book and it's very unique perspective. And I'll dive back into my own questions. Um, but uh, Alex Morena on Facebook asks, do you think the concept of globalism or supranationalism has further strayed us away from the concept of a melting pot? It, it absolutely has. And I, um, if you look at some of the first um, opponents uh, of the melting pot back in the early 1900s, people like uh, Randolph Bourne and uh, Horace Callan, um, they had a philosophy called uh, cosmopolitanism, which is uh, it's kind of the forerunner of modern multiculturalism or, or globalism. And it's the sense that people can be global citizens rather than, you know, attached to, to any national community. And, you know, there's no evidence that that works. Uh, we need communities. Uh, we need to have um entities where where people have a shared sense of belonging and and the global scope is is a little bit too big for that i think uh, it needs to it needs to be a little more local uh and you know even a country of 300 million i think is kind of stretching it uh one of the we talked in the past about this dichotomy between um the wealthier, uh, more educated elites being for this multicultural model and opposed to the melting pot. Um, but the irony is that uh, modern progressives are pushing both the hard multiculturalism, uh, multicultural particularism, and a more expansive interventionist approach to government. Um, why are the two such a toxic combination yeah I, I, that's that's a great question and and it really it, it gets right to what I think is one of the most important points of of my book and and, and that's that um I'm trying to think of the best way to way of putting it I if you step back and and, and think first of all uh, you know in what circumstance does does a big expansive government work uh it works in a in a nuclear family Right. My nuclear family is communist. <laughs> right. Everybody gives according to their abilities and takes according to their needs. And, you know, maybe a slightly larger group, uh, a, a clan can uh, can work that way or a kibbutz in Israel. But the more and more that you have divergent group in, interests within a society, the more difficult it is to make big government work. Uh, and so we can see this play out in real life. You know, who are who are the countries that that have the greatest success with with big government? It's uh, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland. Right. Well, what's distinct about those countries? They're they're the most homogeneous countries in the world. Uh, what happened? Natural resources in some cases as well. Uh, yes, exactly. And I talk about that in the book that, that you know, Norway, uh, you know, they, they have a trust fund from their oil that's that's equivalent to 
practically a million dollars a person. <laughs> so that that helps pay for a lot of socialism. Uh, so so that's a big factor in there too. But yeah, you know, even even when you take that into account, they have a little more success because they're all on the same page. Uh, what happens when you have divergent groups who have different values and different priorities and see themselves as groups, and, th and then you have a big government? Well, well, two things happen, is that when the government is distributing all kinds of different goodies, each group has a strong incentive to gain control of that government and divert those goodies to, to people like them. And you know this is a story of Africa. And so the stakes for controlling that government become very high. And this is why all over Latin America, all of Africa, you have continuous revolutions and coups because they're, you know, each group wants to wants to seize that big government and devote, devote the resources to themselves. Uh, you know, so, so, so that's that's one big piece of it right there is is that it, it raises the stakes for controlling the government. If all the government were doing was providing a national defense and designing flags, nobody would fight over it, right? There, there, there would be no, no contention. Over right. It. But yeah. But it, if it's now about the curriculum and it's now about the kind of uh, books that we're going to have in the schools and it's about when we're going to talk about what kind of sex education and you know so then uh, all of these there there's pretty divergent views on that there, there's not a complete unified view uh, and so you could see why that would set up this kind of very contentious competition over who gets to impose their view of the best way on everybody else. Thanks. Exactly. When, when, when the government controls 60, 70 percent of the economy, there, there, there is a huge you know, desire to, to seize control of that. And so there's another piece to this, too. And that's that, you know, all the all the bad things, um, the negative aspects of ethnic diversity um, that do occur, they mostly occur through government. So the, the bigger the government is, the greater those effects are going to be. Um, you know, let's just take racism as an example. I, you know, I think I have this from Walter Williams. He talked about in South Africa. Uh, originally, the mining companies, who were terrible racists, they hired all kinds of black people, right? Because not hiring black people imposed an economic penalty on them. They're like, yeah, I'm racist, but I'm still going to hire black people because it's in my interest. Uh, it was only when the government stepped in uh, and, and compelled them not to hire black people uh, that, you know, that that happened. So, so racist effects are often uh, achieved through government. Um, it's, it's one of the ways that division has a way of, of propagating itself. So uh, let me give you some concrete examples. Just I mean, to, to, to give you a sense of, of the numbers. And, you know, I'd say, first of all, if, if you take a look at the top 20, top 30 countries in the world for per capita GDP, GDP uh, living standards, uh, the first thing you'll notice is almost all of them are ethnically homogeneous, uh, right? It's Japan, it's Norway, it's uh, Finland, and, 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 and so on. And then you look on that list, and there's some exceptions. Hmm, Switzerland, Singapore, Mauritius. What are those Chile? What do those countries have in common? Well, they also have the freest economies in the world. So there's this interesting interaction between multi-ethnicity and the type of economy you have. Uh, multi-ethnicity works okay uh, if you have, a, you know, a free market capitalist economy because it's all based on voluntary exchange. And and you know, as in the South Africa example. Uh, Free market exchange kind of tends to prevent or it tends to obviate racism because. Or know, could people... it also maybe channel existing uh, rivalries or group pride into productive um, pursuits? So rather than saying, I'm going to try to capture more government jobs for, you know, my team or I'm going to try to uh, capture more affirmative action. Uh, at uh, universities for my race that you're kind of then I'm going to show that it's, you know, us 
Jews that have the smartest doctors or what have you. That's exactly, uh, that's a really nice way of stating it, that, uh, you know, each group's productive enterprise is directed at, at, at making stuff, at succeeding, and not just diverting, you know, getting themselves a larger slice of the government pie. Uh, and that's why it's so important to, to you know, to, to make sure you have a market economy when you have so many ethnic groups. And, you know, to, to give you some hard numbers on it, uh, you know, let's take the countries of Singapore and India, uh, go back to, you know, World War II or, or even, say, 1960. Their, their um, per capita income, Singapore and, and India wasn't very different. Um, so you go, you fast forward 50 years later, uh, Singapore increased its per capita income by a factor of 50 right? Uh, over, over 20, almost $30,000 per person, right? India, well, they only increased by $500. They had a centrally planned economy. Uh, you take Ivory Coast, um, African country, one of the most diverse countries, ethnically diverse countries in, in uh, the world. Yet after World War II, uh, they called it the Ivory Miracle. Uh, while all the all these African countries got independence in the 1960s. Most of them took the socialist command control economy route. And most of them had either flat or negative growth. I mean, some of them literally 15 years after independence, they were worse off than they were under colonialism. Ivory Coast increased their GDP by 400% in 15 years because their president, Hofet Bonny, opted for, for free markets instead of instead of socialism. Uh, same wow. thing, it was even more profound in Botswana. Uh, Bots Botswana increased their um, per capita GDP by 1200% over that time frame. Uh, you know, why? Free markets. <laughs> so in chapter 10, uh, the social and economic costs of ethnic division, you introduced this metric that I hadn't heard of before called ethnic fractionalization. So. What is it? How is it measured? And be, uh, beyond the examples of outright violence and strife, what are some of the other less obvious effects of ethnic fractionalization? Yes. Yeah, so, so ethnic fractionalization is a numeric measure of diversity. Uh, what, it's, what it measures is the probability that any two individuals drawn randomly from, from that country will be from different groups. So that that ranges, uh, it's sort of a zero to one uh, proposition. So in a country like Iceland, it would be zero. In Papua New Guinea or Nigeria, it's around 0.9. Um, and, you know, there's a whole gamut. Um, so it's a really nice way to to associate um, multi-ethnicity or, or ethnic division with all kinds of other social phenomena and GDP and, and so on. And one of the things we see is that that fractionalization index correlates very strongly with practically every single so social pathology you can you can think of. It, uh, higher corruption, government coercion, uh, riots, political violence, civil wars, uh, you name it, almost every single one. And it correlates very strongly with per capita GDP. So, so uh, roughly 38% of the variation in per capita GDP is attributable to that one factor, how diverse a country is. Um, and, you know, which is incredible for a single factor to, to be associated with that much of, of GDP is, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, what about uh, the United States? How how fractionalized, ethnically fractionalized, are we relative to other countries, and what impact does that have or not have on our relative prosperity per capita? Yeah, so so we we actually come out as as not that fractionalized in in the, on the global scale of things. Um, and hmm, you know, I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it has to do with the, the way you do this measure. It's by identification. So if if we actually did it by origins, the United States would ah. be one of the most fractionalized countries okay. in the world, right? So so right. once again, I, you know, I don't think um, you know 
you and I have probably fairly different backgrounds, but I think we would both just identify ourselves as American and not as, you know, uh, in, in my case, German or French or yeah, part, whatever. part German, part Swiss, yeah. because, you know, most of us are so mixed. Anyhow, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's kind of nonsensical to even state what that is. Um, and, you know, that includes many people of color too, who, you know, at this point, the, uh, intermarriage rate for, um, for Asian people in this country is, is nearly 50%. Um, it's close to that for, for Hispanic It's about 20% for black people. Uh, so to, to even refer to yourself as a single ethnicity in this country anymore is, is almost doesn't make sense. So, so on that measure, the United States is less diverse than roughly two thirds of the world. Um, and, and again, so that's, that's that's because of this sort of melting pot paradigm. Uh, in your conclusion, you made what I thought was a really ingenious uh, comparison of the concept of cultural appropriation. You know, for example, dressing up as an Indian chief um, for Halloween, bordering on um, a hate crime from some perspectives, to the uh, Ottoman millet system. So explain. Yeah, so so I, I think I alluded to that system a little earlier, where uh, you know one of the ways the Ottomans succeeded is is by siloing uh, all these different groups, uh, you know, Jews, Orthodox Christians, uh, Armenians, all into these these separate millets. And one of the ways they enforced that distinction is they had specific kind of dress codes and, and cultural sumptuary codes about what people could do. And in one of my footnotes, I actually cite an example of a Muslim elite guy who a judge sentenced to be flogged because he wore a turban that was reserved for Jewish people, uh, or it resembled the Jewish turban too much. So he got in trouble for that. And it's, it's kind of a, a weird analogy to what we have today, where, you know, if, if you take on uh, If you put cornrows in your hair or, you know, exactly, or, you... or <laughs> Or if you, you know, in, in the case of my own state in Oregon, if you, if you open a Mexican restaurant and you happen to be half Asian, as, as was the case with this person in Portland, uh, people pick at you because you're not entitled to make Mexican food because you're not, you know, you weren't born Mexican. It's, it's this terrible form of, of like racial and ethnic essentialism and you know, everywhere, and you'll see this in the book, everywhere that is practice, it ends badly. It ends really badly. Well, um, beyond encouraging people to go out and read your book, which we hope, as uh, we discussed earlier before the show started, will be uh, being made as um, an audio book before long, uh, what do we do to turn this situation around? Um, it, it, beyond, again, just uh, pot, getting more people to understand the history of, of the melting pot and these very cautionary tales throughout history of, of what happened when um, governments pursued this sort of divide and conquer or ethnic particularization. Uh, beyond the history lesson, is there anything that you know, each of us can do as as individuals or members of our community to uh, to perhaps start turning things in a more um, individualist, meritocratic. Yeah, I, I think first off is politically, you know, you have to support any kind of recension or repeal of of all these um, measures that distinguish people by group, and you know. People, some people may think that this this Supreme Court decision with Harvard ended things. It did not at all. You know, I just got uh, a few days ago, well, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my my middle son who's in college got an internship offer, and it was like, yeah, this looks really exciting. At the bottom, it says this this is is for Latin X, uh, Native American, and and Black students. Uh, I guess, you know, if you're Asian, whites or white, need not apply. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, to my knowledge, that's illegal. And, and we have to start protesting stuff like that every single time it happens. Uh, I have a friend who works for a division of IBM. Uh, he got, they got a, a 
dictum from above saying the the their performance reviews would be based on on how many underrepresented minorities they hire not not qualified people underrepresented minorities and you know if you work for a company like that or or your kids are in a school like that you have to protest it um, vigorously and I, you know i think it's gotten to the point where people are are shaking off their fears about speaking out um, because, you know, the one thing I can tell you, and this is, this is probably the most important point I, I, I can impart to you guys, it is that, you know, some people think of these measures as hurting white people or hurting Asian people. They do, but the reality is they hurt all of us. And, and you know, I got that from talking to, to, to Hutus in, in um, Rwanda you know, I said, okay, did, you know, did all those years of preferences, did, did those, make, did those things make, did that make it better for Hutus? And they said, no, of course not. We all ended up worse off because of this stuff. So, so these measures aren't just hurting whites and Asians, they're, they're hurting blacks, they're hurting Latinos too, in, in ways that people don't realize because they're dividing us. Um, so speak out, you know, if your school does that crap, <laughs> say something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. Whether it's as a parent or as a taxpayer or as a shareholder, even with companies um, that are uh, pushing these kinds of metrics, I, I think that uh, um, speaking out and uh, in some cases, uh, maybe even taking legal action uh, sh should be uh, appropriate. So um, I recently, uh, I was sometimes like to close with this question uh, after I interviewed Jonah Goldberg. Um, for his book, he shared some advice he received from Charles Murray, who said, if you set out to write a serious book and it doesn't change your mind on at least a half a dozen issues, you're doing it wrong. So uh, you've been working on this book over really uh, the course of a couple of decades uh, yeah. in terms of the research that you're doing. So the aha moments might have been less dramatic, but uh, were there ways in which you changed your mind or at least things that surprised you as you as you did the uh, research and the writing of this book? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure so many things really changed my mind. It was more like, wow, this is this is an even bigger deal than I imagined. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, that came from, um, you know, read in the book, I actually spoke with uh, people who participated in the Rwandan genocide and, you know, same in, you know, uh, Bosnia and, and the other places I visited. And, and the one thing that, that really caught me off guard is how, how violent and how strong these, these feelings of group antagonism can be and how basically irrational they are. Um, so I, I managed a, a team of engineers in, in Belfast in, in my working career. And, um, you know, I asked people there uh, because, you know, there's a Protestant Catholic divide there. I asked them, you know, OK, you're opposed to these Catholics. Can you tell me what's what's different about the Catholic faith from Protestantism? And most of them couldn't tell me. It's like, well, how many times do you go to church? Well, I, I went three years ago to the Christmas mass. So, so here's this difference that, you know, is, is a big deal, yet when it comes down to it, they can barely identify what the difference even is. And, you know, so people can seize on the tiniest arbitrary distinction and turn it into a nasty, nasty conflict. And I, that's what I saw in uh, interviewing these genocide errors in Rwanda, too, that, that ordinary people became mass killers because of group. Right. You, you don't reach the scale of that kind of uh, uh, genocide with just a, a few bad actors. Yeah, I, exactly. And, I, you know, I, I cite in the book that uh, one out of four adult male Hutus participated. Uh, and, and it just that blew me away. I mean, to think that that. And, you know, it was the same with the Holocaust, too. Right. I, how do you get or how do you turn ordinary people into killers? And and the answer is you divide them into groups and and you you tap into that tribal sense. And and that's you know I'd say that was my biggest rev, revelation in, the, in this research. I, I knew that was there. I just had no idea 
how powerful it is that that just by dividing people into groups, you can you can get them to kill each other with machetes. Uh, it's just stunning. Well, and also I thought a big revelation, at least for me, uh, in reading this book was the the number of examples uh, from both ancient history and more modern history, not all of the uh, countries that decided to pursue more of a melting pot um, had to go through uh, a Rwanda. Uh, there, there were countries that um, and civilizations and polities that uh, adopted that more consciously um, early on. But I think that even in those examples, what the stories you share in this book show is that uh, it's not always easy to maintain and that there are forces that mm -hmm. will uh, try to take advantage, you know, the ethnic uh, opportunists that will try to um, stir up these resentments in, in order to uh, gain more power. So uh, so read the book, uh, stay vigilant. And, um, and Jens, uh, thank you very much for this marvelous achievement and for taking time to talk with us today. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, it's been great. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you who joined, asked the great questions again. Uh, thanks also for your patience. As I mentioned, this was one of those interviews where I had a lot of my own questions. Um, as always, if you enjoyed this video and you are not a something for nothing kind of person, uh, you enjoy the work of the Atlas Society, please consider making a tax deductible donation at atlassociety.org slash donate. Um, and make sure to tune in next week. I'm very, very excited about my interview with author Jennifer Burns. Of course, she is the biographer behind uh, the uh, goddess of the marketplace, uh, one of the early biographies of uh, Ayn Rand. And uh, her latest uh, biography is Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative. So we'll see you then.